Good morning. So if y'all are looking at the schedule, you'll notice that I have the longest slot. So feel free if you need to take a nap. We're going to be talking some math. I know a lot of y'all did not go to law school to do math, and uh, that's fine, but that's what we're going to be doing a little bit of this morning. And so as he already mentioned, my name is Trip Watson. I do a lot of work with early stage entrepreneurs as well as some mid-stage businesses. And a lot of questions that pop up a lot of times is, what is my business worth? Uh, this is not an easy question. Uh, there is a lot of different ways to approach this process. There's different metrics that you look at. There's different things that you'll look at depending on the market. And so we're going to be discussing a lot of those today. Uh, just a brief outline of the points that we're going to be hitting on. The very first thing are just the general controlling principles that we're going to that control business valuation. Uh, we're also going to talk about the standards that are used for assessing value, which you're actually going to look for when you're looking at an asset or in a business in it as a whole. Determining the purpose of that valuation. Why are we actually trying to figure out the dollar number of this business? And then we're going to wrap up with a kind of in-depth look at how we actually do this process. So when we sit down and we look at the financials, what are the numbers that we look at? What are, we, what are the metrics that we care about? How do we actually assess this um, and look at it more in depth? So some of, some of y'all may deal with experts that do business valuations. They may have terms in those agree in their uh, disclosures and in their opinions that have what that business valuation is done based upon and how they arrived at it. So I'm going to kind of give you some of the underlying facts and figures that they'll use in their assumptions when you look at those business valuations. So the very first thing is, is that business valuation is not a very strict science. It is as much an art as it is anything else. And you can't see that it's a, a, it's a, it's a Indian chief who is being rained down upon by blenders, and he says, uh, oh, four steps to the left, then three to the right. What kind of dance was I doing? And this can happen a lot in business valuations. We can look at something and we can say that this is a very particular metric. It's very important for the valuation of the business, and then we find out the next quarter that that metric was not only completely an appropriate measure for, your, for determining what that business was worth, but now it's substantially changed the valuation of the business so much that either we're not interested in it or we got in on the steel. So it, it, there's a lot of different things that we look at, and it's very important to emphasize this is not a science. We put a lot of scientific terms on this. We use a lot of formulas. We use metrics. We use a lot of other things in this, but the valuation of a business is an art. It is not something that is governed by a lot of strict rules. And so it's going to oftentimes be an opinion. Even though in a court, if you sit down and actually take an opinion or try to determine the valuation of a business, it is a factual question. It's determined by the trier of fact. But you're ultimately going to have opinions that push that fact. So the very first thing that we're going to be talking about is the general controlling principles regarding the actual valuation of a business model. Like I said, what we're talking about is much an art as it is a science. So these are general guidelines. They are not hard and fast rules. The two big things that we're going to be looking at are IRS Revenue Ruling 5960 and just general business judgment. You remember back from business organizations, there was the business judgment rule. We're going to be going into that a little bit. The very first thing that we're going to be talking about is IRS Revenue Ruling 5960. So IRS Revenue Ruling 5960 was a ruling issued by the IRS in 1959 that set out what the actual standards were going to be used for assessing the value of closely held businesses. There is a big caveat at the top of 5960. It says that this is not a hard and fast rule. This is guidelines to help practitioners determine what they are looking at when they are attempting to determine the fair market value. And the actual revenue ruling says specifically that the fair market value of anything, 
the asset in any business is the price at which property would exchange hands between a willing buyer and a willing seller when the former is not under any compulsion to buy and the latter is not under any compulsion to sell, both parties having reasonable knowledge of relevant facts. What that basically means is, if you are not under the gun, what would you be willing to sell it for? If the seller, if the buyer is not under the gun and they would be willing to buy it, what is the price in which they would overlap? Now you can see this in the stock market when you look at the actual value of a price of a stock. You'll see that there is the actual price, but then there's a bid and ask price. That gap is what we're looking at. That's the fair market value of that particular bit, of that particular share or share of the business. The reason that it's important to clarify this is that this fair market value is based upon no compulsion. So you're not under a sense of urgency. You're not in a situation where you're about to declare bankruptcy next week. You're not also under a situation in which you are hiding information from the other party that they would otherwise be entitled to. The idea is, is that all cards out on the table, what's your bet? And that's what we're looking at in determining fair market value. Now, of course, this is a moving target. So the IRS further clarified and said that the factors that we need to look at are these. The very first thing is we need to look at the nature of the business and the history of the enterprise from its inception. So I'll give a little bit of a backup again. Keep in mind these are guidelines. This is set, these are clarified by the IRS, but these are not hard and fast guidelines when it comes to the actual practice. But they help in determining what you're looking at, determining a fair market value in the business. What we mean when we say the nature of the business and its history from its inception means how successful has this company been? How long has it been around? What type of a business is it? Is it closely held? Is it a publicly traded company? Is it on the upswing? Is it on the downswing? We take in all these considerations and we try to look at how the business has been performing since the, literally the day that it opened up. We want to have all of that information pretty thoroughly available to us. Next, the outlook economically in general, so as far as in the market that it exists, and also for the market as a whole. So if you have an economy that is flat, not really doing well, uh, as our economy has been doing over the last few years, that's going to play a factor in your valuation. Additionally, if you have an industry that is not doing particularly well, that's going to tease down the value of that particular business. The book value of the stock and the financial condition of the business. When we say book value, this is an accounting term. Using generally acceptable accounting principles, we look down at the books and we say the total value of the assets minus depreciation are X. This is the book value that we've determined. When that book value is determined, it goes into a factoring of the business. We will additionally look at the financial condition of the business. I'll spend a little bit more time talking about that in depth in just a minute. The next biggest thing, and I'll, I'll pause on this because this is probably the single most important factor, and it's even clarified by the IRS as probably being the most important factor, is the earning capacity of the business. And when I say earning capacity, I don't mean gross revenues. If you have $10 million worth of sales and it costs you $12 million to run your business, your business is not making earnings making revenue. But if you have a $1 million business that is kicking off a half million dollars in earnings every year, that is substantially more valuable than that $10 million business because it's kicking off earnings. This is, when you look at practitioners, this is the metric that most will look at. How much money is this business kicking off on a routine basis to investors after all expenses are paid? A corollary to this is dividend paying capacity. Uh, we, we see this big time in uh, publicly traded companies, uh, but practically speaking in closely held companies, you'll see a lot of times they just sit down at the end of the year and they say, okay, well we have this much money in the bank compared to this same point last year, and so we're issuing a dividend. But it's basically a corollary to the earning capacity. 
Another thing that's very difficult to value is intangible, product, uh, intangible assets and goodwill. So what we're looking at in intangible assets is we're looking at the brand. Specifically and legally, we are looking at intellectual property. We're looking at trademarks, copyrights, patents, trade secrets, the big four that you're always looking at in intellectual property. We're looking at the value of those. And there's going to be a sliding scale on whether or not that intellectual property is protected, protectable, or if there's even somebody else that's already using that intellectual property. That's going to shift the valuation of the business as well. Other sales of stock. So if you've previously sold some interest in the business, that's going to be used as a baseline metric in order to help determine the value of the business. So if you sold 10% of your business at $10,000, then it would be reasonable to assume that the valuation of the business would be close to to make big round numbers. The last thing is another metric that we look at to kind of control all else, which is the market price of stocks and corporations engaged in the same or similar types of businesses. So one of the things that we will always do when we look at the value of, the biz of a business is we will look not only at that business, but we will look at the valuation of its competitors. We want to know what other companies are doing. We want to know how well they're doing. We want to know what their earnings are. If we can get prices per shares, if we can get that type of information, that helps us a lot. If you're in a business that does not have a whole lot of competitors, it's probably going to hurt your valuation because you're not going to have some benchmarks in order to compare it to. So tech companies that routinely come out and say that they have absolutely no competition whatsoever, not necessarily something that you want to brag about because your investors are going to want to see who are your actual competitors because there are competitors and what are they actually doing. Can we do this exact same thing more or less expensively by investing in another type of business? The next thing that we're going to be talking about is just general business judgment. What do investors look and in my practice, I work a lot with entrepreneurs that are looking to sell interest in their businesses. Every single business, every single entrepreneur thinks that they have a million dollar idea. It's not necessarily the case. And so generally when you are looking to sell some type of interest in your business, the very first thing that you're going to be looking for is somebody who's willing to put money in. And people that do this typically do it often and they know what they're looking for. And so I typically have to tell my guys, hey, I understand this might be a million dollar idea, but if you're trying to sell your stock to somebody, these are the things that they're going to be looking for. And in their own business judgment, they're going to factor these in significantly. The first thing that they're going to be looking at is the market value of the assets, both tangible and intangible. So they're going to sit down, and after they sign the initial letter of intent and they start getting into the contracts, they're actually going to go through and they are going to look at the actual financial records. They want to see the balance sheet and they want an itemized detailed balance sheet. What are the specific assets that you own? How much are they depreciated? Do they still have usable life? If we took your entire business apart and sold it piecemeal, what would the assets be worth? This provides a baseline idea of what your business is worth. It's probably not the most accurate way, but at the very least, you know, worst comes to worst, we can sell everything and be able to get a little bit of money back. The next thing that they're going to look for is potential for growth. This is something that I'll go into a little bit more in detail in a minute, but obviously, if you have a company that has the potential of doubling in size in the next year or two, then that's going to be a much better investment than the company that's probably had flat line revenues over the last 10 to 20 years. Another thing that a lot of people don't factor in that investors look for, especially if they are already operating a business, is integration with existing business practices. And this can help your business or it can hurt it. So say, for instance, you have, uh, if, you're a institute, if you are a company that is a company that grows by acquisition, 
uh, is going to be much more valuable for you to hunt, to acquire a company that's already using a lot of the uh, infrastructure that you're already using. Say, for instance, you're a hospital that's purchasing another hospital. And that hospital is already using the same electronic medical record system that you are. That's a very easy plug-in. Your evaluation of that company goes up simply because some of the infrastructure works well. It can integrate easily into your existing business practices. The opposite can also be true. Say, for instance, you are a very tech-savvy business and you are acquiring a very old business that did everything by paper. And now you not only do you have to convert everything from paper into electronic, but you have to train everybody on how to use the new systems. This is very difficult to do in a lot of cases. Uh, we see this often when large financial centers merge. Um, large publicly traded businesses, a fantastic example right now is U.S. Airlines and American. Uh, they have been going through merger for the better part of, I guess, two, over a year now. And they're still two separate brands. They have not all the same systems. It is a nightmare having flown on American in the last month. <laughs> and they couldn't even get me on a different flight simply because their internal processes couldn't work together. And this is a factor that a lot of people don't factor in when they're looking to sell their business is how easy is it to integrate into another business. The last thing that I'll mention is strategic considerations. These happen in a very, very small percentage of cases, but they do pop up. And this is when it's advantageous from a strategic standpoint for a business to acquire you or to prevent another competitor from acquiring you. So maybe it's access to some type of intellectual property in which you have the exclusive right to use. Maybe it's a market that you already have a presence in. All of these strategic decisions could play a factor into whether or not your business is attractive from an investment standpoint. And these are all things that you should look at because a uh, fantastic example is there was a uh, GPS company based out of South Carolina, I believe. Uh, they had some pretty interesting technology that crowdsourced uh, where the users use their GPS system and use that to determine real-time traffic. Well, guess who acquired them? Google. Why? Google already had the technology. They didn't need that technology. But a competitor of Google's was creating a similar type of technology, and that competitor was a company called Apple. And when they were coming out with Apple Maps, they needed that technology that this company in South Carolina had developed. This company had never sold a single product and sold for seven figures. So these type of strategic decisions can make a big play and affect the valuation significantly even though there may not be the hard and fast metrics to actually look at why this business is worth that. Any questions so far? I, I, I want to leave this open so that if y'all do have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and stop me, but I do want to, we're kind of at the overview point, move on to the next section, but I want to see if we have anything so far. Okay. The next thing that we're going to be looking at is, what we're going to look at is standards of value. So what is it that we're looking for? What is something worth based upon different standards? The very first thing that we're going to look at is obviously the fair market value. This is what we've already talked about, the IRS clarifies pretty uh, clearly, is it's just what property will change hands at a different at a, at a rate. Pretty basic idea. This is a baseline. A lot of times when investors are looking at fair market value, they're not necessarily looking at the fair market value at that snapshot in time. Often they are looking at what we're calling investment value. The investment value that an investor is looking at is not only the price at which it's worth now, but what is that asset worth to be from an investment standpoint? Is it going to return a 7% return on investment annually? Is it going to be able to sell for three times what it's worth now in two years? What are these different types of investment values that it could be to me in my business? And it's possible that the investment value is actually less than the fair market value. So this one particular asset might be a piece of equipment that I need to have. And the fair market value is $30,000 or so. But I also know that once I integrate that piece of equipment into my business, it's going to make me money, I've got to have it, but it's got a short 
life period. It's going to last only five years, and after that, it's going to be completely worthless. Well, its investment value to me is going to be less than $30,000, even though that's a fair market value. So this will tease the way that the business will look at it and, and affect the way that they value it. If, set, if that same piece of equipment, though, might double in value, then its investment value might be more than $30,000, because you might be willing to pay a little bit extra to make sure that somebody else doesn't get that value. The last measure that a lot of people look at is its intrinsic value. And I, like I said, I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs, and everyone that comes into the door says that they have a million-dollar idea. And what intrinsic value is, what it technically means is, is that it is the sum of all investment values that could possibly be utilized. Practically speaking, that will never happen. You'll never have an asset that has more than one investment purpose. It can't, you can't have an asset that becomes spun off into every single potential opportunity. And so I have to typically coach people to say that, understand that this is a million dollar business idea, but you've got to find somebody that's willing to pay a thousand dollars for it first. And so the intrinsic value often becomes the measure that a lot of business owners get into. That's what they look at, but practically speaking, it's not really the one that we're looking at from an investment standpoint. All right, before we start digging into what you actually look for in a business valuation, we're going to look briefly at determining the purpose. So when I say determining purpose, there's typically reasons that you need to determine why you're doing a business valuation. Maybe the business is going into bankruptcy. Maybe it's seeking an angel investment round. Maybe it's looking to go public. You've got to determine why it is that you're seeking a business valuation before you ever actually go through the process of actually valuing the business because you're going to be looking at different standards. The very first thing that we, the very highest purpose and the highest valuation that you'll get is what we call a going concern. A going concern means that the business is open, it has assets deployed and in place, and it's earning money. It is operating, and all you have to do is put money into the money machine, and it continues to work. A going concern just simply means that it's a business that currently exists that will continue to operate. The reason that you'll get the highest valuation from these is because a going concern is typically the best business to invest in. It requires at least amount of management. Investors are looking to get in uh, on those types of businesses so that they can literally put money in the money machine and they get dividends. The problem with going concerns are is that it does require ongoing management. So this does affect some of the valuation. If a company is not a buy and hold type business that's used to the day to day management, they may not be interested in this. The next that we have is what we call an assemblage of assets. You'll typically see this when somebody is retiring or a business is going through some type of transition, but basically the business is open, but it will not continue to be open in the foreseeable future. So the reason that this receives typically a lower evaluation is because it requires much, much more on-scene management and operational controls. So assemblage of assets means that, yes, the business is currently operating, but you're going to have to hire somebody or do it yourself and actually plug somebody in that manages this business moving forward because whoever's in charge of it now is out. They are not going to be there anymore. The next step down is what we call an orderly uh, disposition. And this is, if you've ever seen from Wall Street, this is taking an airline company and selling it for parts. This is, you're buying the business, you have no desire to continue to operate the business, you are literally getting it for its assets, and then you are going to take those assets and sell them off. Now, this is different from a liquidation, which is the lowest, because there's really no rush on this. It can take a lot of time, you're not in really any cash flow crunch, you can literally sell the assets for what would be considered a fair market value. But because you have no desire to continue the operations or otherwise manage the business, there's really no ongoing value for the earnings that this business might generate. So you're really looking to just sell the assets themselves. Now the bottom is liquidation. Liquidation will receive the absolute lowest rock bottom valuation. And the reason for that is typically you're in a cash flow crunch. 
this is a bankruptcy or you're pending on bankruptcy, and so you are literally trying to sell assets to get cash in the bank to pay off somebody else. The reason that this receives the lowest liquidation, the liquidation receives the lowest valuation is because urgency plays the biggest factor. If you've got to sell a car tomorrow, you're going to sell it for a lot less than you're going to sell it if you've got 90 days to sell that same car. Same idea. If you've got to move on something, you're going to receive the lowest valuation, and typically people will take advantage of that. Liquidation value often becomes the measures that we look at in, in actual bankruptcy. All right, so we're moving into the process uh, side of things. Any questions so far? All right, this is a real quick, I did not have any intention of you actually being able to read this. Um, this is the process. Nice little flow chart to walk you through everything that you look through. And, and you'll see that there's arrows that move back, and we check this, and then we go back to this. This is a, it's a flow chart that I found. It's not one that I personally use, but I think it's funny just because you can see where all the different arrows would have been. This is part of the process. We go in and we look at something, we check it, and we go back through, we plug some numbers, and we we go back and check something else, and then we get quarterly reports to the next quarter, and we go back and check those against everything, and then change our assumptions. And this is an ongoing process. Practically speaking, if you're a publicly traded company, this happens every single day in microseconds, and it gets updated every single time that you issue quarterly reports. In a closely held company, this might be done only when you're trying to sell the business. So it might be done once every ten, once in a ten-year span. Uh, but it's important to look at the processes, kind of understand what you're looking at. Now, moving forward, I'm going to be hitting on some things that we need to pay, pay special attention to as attorneys, specifically some, some, some terms that to look for when you're looking at the valuations and when you're looking at these types of deals. So, specifically, the process is a three-step process. The very first thing is a basic financial it's to look at the books, it's to get an understanding of how the business is set up. The next is to actually normalize those financial statements. So we take those financial statements and we compare them against other benchmarks. And then once we've established those benchmarks, we actually go through the process of valuing, valuing the business using one of three methods and sometimes a combination of all three. The very first thing that we're going to be talking about is financial analysis. Who here has had an accounting class? So, about half. This is going to be a review for y'all, um, but I think it's important to go through this to hit on some of the high points. Every single financial analysis of a business will focus on at least four of the main financial reports. The first one being, obviously, the balance sheet. The balance sheet is a snapshot in time for a business. It shows what the company owes and what it owns. It doesn't show you what it owned last week. It doesn't show you what it will owe next year. It is simply showing you a cross-section of that business. The analogy I often use is to think of a water pipe. And you have a business that is the pipe, and the business is income that flows through that pipe. When you have a balance sheet, you're looking at a cross-section of that pipe. You're seeing how much water is in that pipe. And the idea behind looking at a balance sheet is you want to get an asset. The balance sheet will show, will show three things. It will show the assets of the company, it will show the liabilities, and it will show the owner's equity, which all of that, all of the assets must equal, or excuse me, the Assets must equal the liabilities plus equity. That's why it's called the balance sheet. You got to balance those things out. If there are more if there are more assets than liabilities, then you will have positive owner's equity. If you have more liabilities than assets, then you will have negative owner's equity, which means that your company is essentially worthless. The reason that it's important to look at the balance sheet is the very very beginning got to have an idea of what type of debt load your company's under. If they've got some outstanding loans, if they've got some accounts receivable that they have that are significant on the balance sheet, you need to know about those when you're looking at these. So if you've got a deal that comes across your desk, the very first thing is you want to see the balance sheet. 
I want to see what assets they're claiming, itemized, detailed, report. And I want to see what liabilities there are. Who do you owe money to? What loans do you have outstanding? Who other vendors do you have? If you all remember from business organizations, your vendors and employees get paid first. Your owners get paid last. So if you have an outstanding liability that doesn't get paid on time, it can accelerate that liability, cause it to be due tomorrow, and your entire deal gets shot. So you got to know all of those liabilities going into it. You also want to know the assets. You want to have an itemized list of the assets. You want to have an idea of what they actually claim to own. When you actually go through the due diligence process, you will go through and check and make sure that they actually own the things that they say. You'll go through and check and make sure that they're sitting in the warehouse, and if they're not, then that gives you cost to get out of the agreement. But just as importantly as that, you want to be able to determine what the actual market value of those assets are. And then, like I said before, they may be the book value, which is the purchase price minus depreciation, which is accounting. But that might also be an asset that is worth more than its book value, that its fair market value might be worth more if it were sold, because it still has some worth to someone. Now, the next thing that we're going to be looking at is the income statement. So after we've looked at the balance sheet, we've figured out everything that they owe, we want to see the income statement. The income statement is profit and loss statement. It's generally called P&Ls. These are typically the most heavily scrutinized financial document during these types of deals. We want to know how much money you made. We want to know how much money you spent. Where did it go? Why? And how that works. An income statement is different from a statement of cash flows in that an income statement shows you what the business makes money in from its primary operations. So if the company sells widgets, we want to know how much does it, how much money do you make from the sale of widgets? How much money did the widgets cost? And then what are the flat the fixed expenses that it takes in order to create widgets? We don't care that last year you sold a building and made $200,000 off of it. That's going to show up in your statement of cash flows. That's not an operational concern. The, state, the income statement shows what you're doing from an operational standpoint. So that's the reason why it's generally the most scrutinized. The last thing that we'll talk about is, or I'll briefly hit on statement of cash flows. Statement of cash flows show everywhere you're getting money. So, for instance, if you purchased major equipment last year, you're probably not going to see that purchase of equipment on the income statement. It's going to show up on the statement of cash flows. But you're also going to see that the cash balance sheet on the, the cash on the balance sheet is significantly lower, and that's where you tie that in. So you can say, okay, well, they spent a bunch of money buying a building, and that's not really necessarily an operational expense. They might depreciate that or amortize that over a period of time in order to reflect that on the expenses. But it doesn't necessarily affect anything from the operational standpoint. The last thing is the statement of changes in owner's equity. The reason that this is really important is, is you want to see that they're actually adding owner's equity and not taking it away. So as I mentioned before, that balance sheet is a snapshot in time. It is a cross-section where the income statement will show where the water is flowing through the pipe. The statement of changes in owner's equity shows how, much, how big the bucket is at the end of the pipe. If water is leaking out of the bucket faster than it's being refilled, then you've got a problem. And that's not going to be reflected on the balance sheet. Because it's just going to say, owner's equity is blank. But the statement of changes in owner's equity will show you this company is getting more value or it's getting less value. And that's going to affect the valuation. All right, once we get all these financial statements, and, and there's plenty more that you can get, you can get. Uh, Profit and loss by customer, you can get a lot of these and get really, really detailed. A lot of times you'll get somebody that gets in and actually goes through each individual account to make sure that those accounts are under contract, what the terms are, and actually figuring out what these individual accounts are worth. And deep access to the books typically helps, but at the very least, you, know, you say for instance, you've got a deal that's only worth, you know, you've got a business that's changing hands for 30000 bucks. It's not going to be really worth it to do a complete teardown audit of that business, but you still want to have some idea of what you're looking at. You can look at a uh, statement. You can look at the four big financial statements. The next thing that you want to do is what we call normalizing the financial statements. When you get a, especially in closely held companies, 
you will see some very interesting accounting techniques. And by say, when I say interesting accounting techniques, I mean bad accounting techniques. So the very first thing that we've got to do is we've got to go in and once we've looked at the financial statements, we've got to say, all right, you know, I understand that you're categorizing this one particular thing as a cost of goods, but it's not really a cost of goods. Um, maybe the IRS is, is letting you get away with that, but in this particular industry, we're not counting that as cost of goods sold. And so what we typically look at is we try to normalize four big things. The first thing that we look at are comparability adjustments. We want to put you on the same level playing field as we're another company that we're looking at, so we get an idea of how good you are relative. So, practically speaking, if you've got something that's categorized as a cost of goods sold or something like that, we want to put that in the same line item as something else. So, we want variable expenses to match variable expenses. We want fixed expenses to match fixed expenses. We want to put that on the same idea, on the same line, so that we can compare two financial statements to, to each other. The next thing that we want to do is we want to get rid of all non operating expenses or income. So say for instance you had that building that you sold last year for $200,000, great, glad you made a lot of money from that, but you sell widgets, we're buying you because you sell widgets. We don't care that you sold a building and made a $100,000 profit on it. We care about what you're doing from an operational concern. So we're going to trim away all that other insignificant stuff and we're going to look at the core business, which is why we look at the income statement and not the same thing cash flow. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to trim out all the stuff that doesn't happen on a routine basis. Say, for instance, you're in a business that doesn't do a lot of big projects. You're kind of a volume-based business, and you get this one big project that end up being 10% of your total gross revenues that one year. It's great. I'm glad you got that, but you don't do that on a consistent basis. We're not really going to factor that into your valuation. We're going to trim that out as well. Uh, say, for instance, you had another big expense that you decided to purchase equipment or something like that. We're probably not going to give you credit for that business valuation. That's just part of doing business. So we'll trim out the non-reoccurring expenses. We want to get an idea of what the business looks like on a day-to-day -day continuing operations business. Last thing that we'll do is we'll trim out discretionary expenses. So say, for instance, you've got a couple of guys that are in upper management that have big expense counts. We're going to trim those guys out because we're probably going to end up replacing those. Say, for instance, you decided to remodel the, the office and put in a bunch of nice paintings. We don't care about that. We're going to trim those discretionary expenses out. Maybe you've got a one-off client that came in and you had a big balance sheet on that or a big revenue opportunity on that. We're going to trim those out as well. Now we're getting to the fun part. <laughs> so after we've all done the nitty-gritty work, now is the time that we start doing math. There's big three valuation methods. The very first one is called income, the next one is asset, the last one is market. And the reason that I show this at a high level is if you do work with anybody that does a lot of business valuations, everybody has their preferred method of looking at a business. Some will use an income method, some will use simply an asset method, and some will use some type of market method. I'll go through the specifics of what they're going to do. But when you get a report from a business valuation expert, they're typically going to tell you the different methods that they use. They're going to use an income method. That's say, using the income method, we determine the value of the business to be $300,000. But using an asset method, we've determined that the, ad, the value of the business is only $60,000. But also using a market method, we've determined that it's worth $600,000. We're going to average all those out and say it's $310,000. So you'll see that often. But we're going to go through exactly what these mean, so you'll kind of get a basic idea. And I'm not going to go in deep into these, because these get pretty intimidating pretty fast. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the income method, which is this. Just when y'all thought y'all were getting away from the math, there's it right there. This is a very complicated looking formula that's not that complicated. Basically, K uh, equal, uh, on the left of the equal sign, that's just the value of the business. The first thing that we're going to be looking at is how risky is your business? Do you sell cars in a pretty car-friendly market? Pretty stable income streams? Or, I don't know, do you sell something that might be illegal in nine months? I've seen both. <laughs> uh, the risk that your business has, yes, 
you got anybody that are trying to get into the vaping business, I would discourage them from that. Um, but yeah, so you have to determine at the very beginning what the risk of a business is. And what the income method does is it looks at the risk of a business compared to other opportunities. Now it's very important to remember that every single business valuation is relative. We are going to look at how good your business looks compared to another business opportunity. And if we don't have a very good measure to look at another business, it's going to affect our ability to not only invest in your business, but even our interest in doing so at all. And so the very first thing that you're going to be looking at is, what are my comps? You know, if, you, if anybody here does um, property valuations, the very first thing that you look at are, what are your comps? What are, pro what are other sales that you have in the area? We do the same thing in business valuation. You're going to sit down and you say, what other businesses are out there? What do they earn? And what is the risk factor that plays into it? And that's what the income method attempts to calculate. And all of this is simply saying that the very first number that we have on there is RF. And this is a capital asset pricing model. Uh, some guys actually won a Nobel Prize for putting this together back in the 60s. Um, but really the idea is, is that the value of your company is only worth something so long as its benefit outweighs its risk. And we just simply put this in a mathematical formula. RF is the risk-free rate. It's what we would make if we stuck our money in a 10-year treasury note. Uh, the generally acceptable baseline that everybody's going to look at is if I bought 10 year US Treasury bonds that is considered risk free. There's almost no chance that that is going to default and I'm going to get some return on investment and it may not even be inflation but at least it's risk free. The next thing that we're going to look at the, the, the beta and the parentheses is how risky your business is compared to that 10 year Treasury. If I'm going to make 1% in the treasury note, I could potentially make 7% a year in your business. My net gain would be 6%. But beta, that little figure that you have there, is the volatility of the business. So say, for instance, you're in that business that might be in a situation where you say, hey, your business might be made illegal in nine months. That beta is going to be really, really high. It's going to mess with us. It's going to mess with our valuation of your company. And it's going to throw off the valuation so that we're not interested in um, investing in your business because there's too much risk. Uh, the last two numbers are simply other uh, stock value prices that are just get thrown in there. But practically speaking, for closely held companies, they don't factor in. But basically, the reason that Cap M exists, if you ever hear somebody say Cap M, is it simply saying that the value of your business bears a direct relationship to its relative risk and its volatility? When we are looking at this practically, we're looking at this. Another scary math thing. So if anybody that's looked at these, you'll understand some of this. But really the idea is the value of a business is worth how much money it's going to kick off over the next several years, whatever our horizon is. So say, for instance, I'm an investor. I'm going to invest in a business for a five-year period. I need to know how much money that business is going to kick off over the next five years. So if that company has consistently been kicking off $100,000 a year, then that's a pretty good investment, and I'm going to value the company accordingly. However, I'm going to give that money, that company a little bit more business if it kicks off $500,000 in the first year as opposed to if it kicked off $500,000 in the last year and did nothing in between. And that's what time value of money comes down to. So this big, um, the reason that this formula exists, it's big intimidating, but it basically just says that the value of the company is directly related to how much money you can kick off over a period of time discounted for its current worth. Because money in a dollar a day is worth a lot more than a dollar in a year. And so we've got a bunch of formulas that we use on this, but basically the top line that you see, that's uh, FC, FL, that's free cash flows. 
how much money is the company kicking off, and then we're dividing that by the weighted average cost of capital, which means we've got other investors that are in line in front of us, we've got other debtors we've got to pay, so after we pay those guys off using our free cash flows, how much left over for us? And then we're going to take the sum of all of those over the next five years and factor in what the value of our business is. This is one method of doing a business. I, I like this idea. If you have a pretty good idea of what the company is going to be able to kick off in dividends, the problem is you don't know. Especially in closely held companies, for those of you that work with closely held companies, you're going to be in a situation where these guys have never really had any kind of consistent way of kicking off money to themselves. They just look at the bank account at the end of the year and say, hey, yeah, we'll write ourselves a check. Um, that's not necessarily the best way to determine how what the dividends will be in the future. Maybe you can structure that, make it a little bit more rigid and whatnot. But this method is really, really good if you know what they're going to be kicking off. It's useless if you have no idea and it's inconsistent. So if you look back and you say, well, yeah, yeah, in 2014 they issued $100,000 worth of dividends and they kicked off a bunch of money, it was great. But in 2013 they lost money. They actually had to pay in that capital. The year before that, it was like $20,000. The year before that, they had another capital call. That's what we call inconsistent cash strains, and this method becomes absolutely worthless. So what people will typically look at is they'll look at an asset model. Now, the income model is the best and highest use of everything, but it makes a lot of assumptions, and the assumptions don't necessarily always end up being that good. So at the very least, we use what we call an asset model. And this is typically what you'll look at when you're looking at bankruptcy proceedings, when you're looking at uh, disposition of assets, or when you're looking at just trying to liquidate a business. You're going to look, bottom line, what are the sum of the assets? What are the liabilities? What's the company worth? Generally, when I do partnership buy-sell agreements, this is my measure for determining the valuation of the business. I don't make it complicated, I don't do a bunch of other things. I say, we're going to have an independent accountant, they're going to go through, they're going to check the books, they're going to say how much assets are out there, how much liabilities, we're not going to do a valuation of the business as a going concern, we're just going to figure out what the business is worth today from a book standpoint. You own half, you write 50% check to the other guy, and I have partnerships over. <clears throat> it's the easiest way to do this very quickly get in and do a accounting on this. A brief aside, I forgot to hit this first, but I meant to mention this on financial statements. You're going to have three types of financial statements when you get it issued by a CPA. The very, very lowest standard that you're going to have is reviewed. They're going to look at the bottom line financial statements and say, yeah, well, you know, we looked at it. We didn't want really to do anything else. Uh, we're taking absolutely no liability on the tax return on this because we have no idea about the underlying numbers. Um, the, net, the highest level that you're going to have is audited. So they're actually going to go through and they're going to say, accounting firm is typically going to have somebody in there, sits in the back room, goes through the receipts, they're going to check the equipment, make sure that they have it there. When you're going through these types of valuations, I almost always recommend going and getting an audited financial statement. These may be cost prohibitive. That's fine, I'd rather, especially if you're dealing at arm's length with somebody, you're getting into an investment that you've been with somebody that you've never met before, the parties don't know each other, haven't been closely involved in the business, get audited financial reports. If it's just review, it means nothing. They could be, there could be outright, outright lies in the financial records, and I've seen them. Just don't do it. Get you, account, get you an audited financial statement. It's typically worth it. Um, there's very few situations if the valuation is just incredibly low and you're literally just trying to buy it for scrap, that's fine. You can get away with not doing an audited financial statement, but you're going to have to have a lot of disclosures in your agreements. Um, get you some audited financial statements if you can. But the reason that this becomes very important is once you've actually audited the business, you've gone through, you've done your depreciation schedules, you've actually figured out what the actual assets are worth from a book standpoint, you're rarely going to have a situation in which two accountants assess widely different valuations from a book standpoint. 
So this is a pretty reliable method to sit down and say, at a baseline valuation, this is what our companies work. This is why I use this in buy-sell agreements. It's easy to get an independent accountant to sit there and say, at the end of the day, these are the assets, these are the liabilities, this is what, this is what who owes what. The last method is a relatively new method. It's called the market method. It's my personal favorite method of valuing a business, and I'll tell you why. Um, but you'll also see it because it's very easy to do, uh, and you'll often hear it when it makes headlines. They'll typically use the market methods. And the market method is also called valuation by multiples. So if you say, oh yeah, that company sold for an eight multiple or three multiple or whatever, that's what this method is. It's different from the income method because it attempts to simplify that process into just plugging in a multiple. But what it basically does is, is it takes some critical metric in the business and it says this is the metric we're going to use and then we're going to multiply that by something based upon how attractive your business is compared to other investment opportunities. So the one that you'll hear a lot of is Valuation by multiples are based upon gross revenues. This is a terrible, 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 terrible idea. It is dumb. I have people do it all the time. Don't do this. If you have a company and they think that they are worth anything more than a single year's worth of revenues, they better have earnings back. You see this all the time in tech companies. I'm a member of the Alabama Angel Network. Uh, Central Alabama Angel Network. I see, I've seen over a hundred pitches in my life. I've seen this method used in half of them. It is terrible. I cannot emphasize this enough. Do not value a business based on gross revenues. The reason for this is gross revenues mean nothing. They are vanity metrics. Yeah, it's great that you sold $10 million worth of business. It's fantastic. But it's costing you $1.2 million to run your business, and you're losing money. Gross revenues mean nothing. Um, I had a situation where a client not too long ago was using this method, and I had to talk them out of it uh, after the course of about three months. Once they finally did, they actually got a pretty accurate valuation, and um, they realized their company was actually worth what they thought it was using another measure. But for some reason, everybody wants to use gross revenue. Do not. If somebody does a valuation based upon gross revenue, run for the hills. This is a red flag. This uh, dividend yield is a great way to do a business valuation if you have a publicly traded company, even if it's not based on a major stock exchange. Uh, if you have a pink sheet, um, it's very difficult to determine the valuation of a company that's traded on pink sheets. Uh, pink sheets, for those of you that don't know, they, they are still publicly traded companies, but they are not on a major stock exchange. They're typically not traded often. The trades are not reported as often as they are for the major stock exchange. And so you can go months without getting an updated price per share. So it's spitballing a lot of times. Um, penny stocks, a lot of times traded on pink sheets. But the reason that dividend yield becomes very a very reliable method is, is you can look back and using kind of the income method, you can actually go back and say that this company has kicked off this much per share in dividends every single year, and we can multiply that and say that this business is worth this amount of money. Problem is, if you got a closely held company in which somebody issues their dividends at the end of the year willy nilly, then eh, you're just not going to do a very reliable method. This is a ends up being a pretty bad method to value closely held companies simply because. Dividends are not issued with any type of regularity, and there's really no formula to do it, and so it's very difficult to, to, to use this. The last one, in my personal favorite, is EBITDA. You'll hear it's pronounced different ways. EBITDA, EBITDA, um, I use EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's what you made before you paid everybody else outside of the main operations. The reason that this is the most telling metric for most businesses is that it really shows you how much money is available for distributions from main operations. The reason I like this is you typically have a pretty tight 
multiple range. So gross revenue, you might have some crazy multiples like um, Uber, I think right now is going for something like a 300 multiple off of gross revenues. And it's what we call a unicorn startup. It means that it's a, a BS valuation, frankly. Um, but EBITDA gets you down into a much tighter range. You typically have a pretty good idea of what the business is worth. So me as an investor, I can say, okay, well, your business is making approximately $100,000 a year in EBITDA which means that after you pay all your main operations, cost of goods sold, your employees, and basically everybody from main operations, you have $100,000 left over to pay financing, which is not a core mission, taxes, which is not a core mission, and depreciation and amortization, which are accounting uh, changes. So that's how much money that your company has to technically issue dividends on. And we can say, if we purchase your company, for three times EBITDA, we can pay off our investment in a little over three years. So it's a pretty easy method for an investor to come in and say, hey, this is a great way for us to look at this. We can say, this is what our payoff period is. We can do a time value of money on it. And it's also a good way to establish a baseline if the company has growth potential. Because you can come in and say, okay, yeah, you know, the, it's currently making $100,000 a year in EBITDA. We can pay $300,000, but this company is actually standing to potentially grow 20%, so we'll increase that multiple a little bit. Uh, so this is a I, my personal favorite. Uh, this is used often in service industries and manufacturing. You typically don't see it in technology companies simply because technology companies have crazy people doing their valuations. Um, so, you know, I like EBITDA. There are some problems with EBITDA. The main reason is, is that it typically relies on a pretty consistent cash flow. Uh, if you have wide swings in EBITDA from one year to the next, then it's going to be a bad metric for you to look at. You're going to have to look at some other measure. Um, but it typically gives you a good idea. Um, the reason that I mentioned these three, the income method, the asset method, and the market method, is typically they are all used in some type of conjunction in that business value. No one should be used exclusively. If your company has growth potential, then using simply its assets is a bad me measure because your company could potentially grow. However, if you're using gross revenue and multiplying that times 10 to determine that your company is a million dollar company, it's a terrible metric because your company might be in debt. They might have absolutely no sales. So you want to look to one of the other metrics in order to look at and figure out how well the company is doing. I say all this, but it's important to understand something from a high level. A lot of business valuation becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. As I mentioned before, this is as much an art as it is a science. A lot of times we use these, met these measures, these metrics, in order to satisfy ourselves with the valuation that we want to put on the business. A lot of times, the methods become the tail that wags, or the actual valuation itself becomes the tail that wags the metrics and dollars. So I like this particular, if y'all have noticed, I like far side jokes. But uh, if you can't read that, it says, uh, so in the general relativistic sense, we find that the dynamic fraction of the tensor light come to actually be negative, creating a focal convergence of photons, which causes the stars at night to be big and bright, especially in the heart of Texas. And I, th I, I saw this and I thought it was hilarious because a lot of times we can use valuation methods to actually prove ourselves right. We can look at a company, we can look at the valuation, we say, really quickly, and if you have companies that do uh, growth by acquisitions, I mean, I've, I've seen some guys that can literally look at an income statement and get pretty accurate on what their actual valuation is and what the company is going to do just by looking at 12 months itemized financial statements. But when we actually do the financial evaluation and look through everything, a lot of times we're trying to seek that goal. Somebody says, oh yeah, this company's worth $250,000. Okay, well let's go through and actually do this and we're going to be 
trending towards that $250,000 number. And a lot of times it becomes a tail that wags the dog. This is important to keep in mind when you're doing business valuations because a lot of times you are trying to justify the end. So it's important to recognize that bias because you're going to have some folks that ultimately try to do that. But it's also important to remember that, as I mentioned before, this is an art. It's not necessarily a science. We do have some methods that we use to justify some of the underlying assumptions that we make, but they're not exclusive and they're not always reliable. So you might get into a situation, as I mentioned before, in which one metric may be fantastic in 90% of circumstances, but you might fall on that 10% where it's a terrible, terrible decision to use that metric. And it's difficult to know that. And oftentimes it becomes um, hindsight's 20-20. We valued this company at this, this, and this because we made an assumption based upon the growth rate that they own these particular assets, that this piece of intellectual property was properly protected and we come to find out that this provisional patent didn't approve, that that income stream that we were so reliant upon based upon a reoccurring client, he decides that he's not going to renew his contract, or he breaches his contract. He says, I'm out. All of these valuation methods go out the window when the underlying assumptions no longer exist. And so all of that to say that this is not something that is you're not going to be able to go into a court of law and say, this is the method that should be used. Judge, you should say that this is the valuation. You're going to have to put up, a, uh, if it goes to litigation, you're going to have to put up experts. It's, it's a battle of experts a lot of times in these situations. And so you're going to want to know what your assumptions are. So not only can you talk to your own expert, which you can cross down with an opposing expert, but also if you're drafting the actual transactional documents to know what type of methods to use. So that kind of hits the big points on business valuation. I know it's pretty early in the morning on Friday to be talking math, but I do want to leave myself open to questions. My contact information is up there. If you do have any follow-up questions, I always get follow-up questions. I'm more than happy to answer these. But I do want to kind of leave it open because I guarantee you if you have a question, Somebody else has the same question. So, question.